All right. Welcome to Book by Book, everybody. Tonight, uh, we are continuing through Jeremiah, and we will be uh, just covering two chapters. One chapter is longer than the other. Um, and so as I was preparing uh, for this week, I was kind of feeling a little overwhelmed by how long chapter 23 was. And then turned the page to 24 and I was like, oh, this is only 10, cha- 10 verses. I can handle this. So um, yeah, so we are going to continue seeing uh, Jeremiah bring correction to the kings and the priests and the prophets. And the uh, chapter 24 then is a a visual oracle of sorts where the Lord shows Jeremiah these this basket of figs. And it is an interesting uh, way that the Lord talks about what these figs mean. Uh, and it is probably not what anybody would have expected. And so, um, yeah, so let's jump in. Chapter 23, and we will be starting with verses 1 through 4. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. So this is a um, a woe oracle. And woe uh, is a good old-fashioned biblical word that is like a warning, watch out. Um, It is a, a heavy warning. So it's not just a... Um, yeah, it's not something to take lightly when the word woe is thrown out. And this warning is for the shepherds. And as we continue to unpack what, what they're talking about with the shepherds, this is really looking at the kings of, uh, of Jerusalem. And they have been uh, mistreating the people and not actually helping them follow the path of life that God wants his people to, uh, to walk upon. And so this, um, yeah, so these shepherds are these kings. And so one of the challenges with Jeremiah is uh, the different oracles that we read may not have been presented uh, chronologically. Like we read it chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, but the book of Jeremiah itself may have been compiled by one of Jeremiah's protégés or somebody. Um, And so the oracles don't always hit in timeline uh, the way they should, but they are usually connected to some kind of theme. And so we are kind of coming into a uh, a section that is more thematically linked around the exile. Um, and so that's one of what the things that's being introduced here is this idea that God is has scattered them into all the nations, right? And so the, the Northern Kingdom uh, was taken by the Assyrians, uh, and now Jerusalem and Judah is are facing the same kind of fate, but with the Babylonians. And so the um, the shepherds, uh, the the kings were not taking care of the people. And so the king here uh, could have been uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakin, uh, Jehoahaz. It could have been any of these kings. We're not totally sure exactly which one at this point. Um, and so. Yeah, but we will get more clarity in the next chapter on like when exactly um, Jeremiah is speaking. But this is one of those ones that's kind of up there. But the harsh judgment here uh, on these shepherds is instead of the sheep being the ones who are being disciplined, it's the shepherds who should know better, who should have been walking in the way of the Lord themselves. One of the key elements of the law for the, the king is that the king would write out their own copy of the law. Uh, And that way they would be able to keep the law in their heart and in their minds as they're writing it out by, by hand. Uh, We don't really have any evidence that any of the Kings did that. um, But they, that was something that was given in the law in Deuteronomy. And so because there's a uh, bit of wordplay here as well, as we're talking about the shepherds Um, in verse two, it says, because you have not visited or attended your sheep is uh, and so that's part of the work 
that the the shepherd is supposed to do is to attend to the sheep. Uh, the Lord is saying he will visit the shepherds. He will attend to them in order to punish them. And so the the um, continuing that that word visit uh, is the it's coming back and forth instead of looking like shepherds should care for their sheep. Jesus or the Lord is now saying, uh, "You have been." Uh, negligent, and now you are getting a, a visit from your authority. Um, and so they are doing the exact opposite of what the kings should be doing. Um, and they, the kings have scattered them. Instead of the shepherds corralling the people, the kings are pushing them away and just like creating disunity among the people because of their own rebellion. And um, But in the midst of all this, the Lord is promising to call out a remnant. And that is a consistent theme throughout the prophets, the, the faithful remnant that the Lord will restore his people someday. And so here's one more time where the Lord is saying, I'm going to bring a, a remnant and good shepherds. So um, later we're going to see this, the image of the branch that is going to come. And that's a very messianic picture um, but when we get to the gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And, and so there is an echo here back to this moment, this descendant of David, this branch from the line of David, this future king that the people were longing for the Messiah. They were longing for this kind of good shepherd that the Lord would bring. And so the that's one of those uh, things where Jesus is intentionally like, tying his ministry and his message to messianic expectations from the old testament i am the good shepherd the kind of shepherd that the lord spoke about in jeremiah and so it's not just jesus being like isn't that a cute image of like shepherds like no there's a biblical expectation for for what the messiah is going to do and and jesus is stepping in to to that expectation so and the next section starts to unpack a little bit more about the coming righteous king. Uh, and so in verse uh, 23, 5 through 6, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. And so the, the image of a branch as a royal heir was something that was very common in the ancient world. And even when we talk about family trees, we talk about branches in the family tree. Um, and so the family tree branch of David was the, the descendants who would rule on the throne. But we have read in Isaiah that the tree was chopped down. And uh, or the tree would be chopped down and that there would be a shoot. That would grow up. And Jeremiah is continuing that image of, of saying like, there's this, a, a shoot that's going to come up a branch that will be uh, righteous, that will care for the sheep, that will lead them to safety. Um, and yeah, so all of this is part of the good shepherd metaphor that, that Jesus is talking about. And his, his original audience would have clued into that a little bit more than what, than we would normally do. We have to kind of dig for it because we're not generally as well versed in the the prophetic expectations for the Messiah. But the people in Jesus's time would have been like, "Oh, he's he's talking Jeremiah stuff right now. He's talking like big, big promises from God of a a royal, a royal branch." And so this is where the dating, also in this section, where the dating. Uh, of the of this oracle in particular, uh, people are thinking that it is most likely during the reign of Zedekiah, uh, which was it, Zedekiah is the last king uh, in Jerusalem, and uh, Zedekiah's name means the Lord is righteous or the Lord is my righteousness, and so here in verse six, uh, the new king, the righteous branch that's coming will be called the, the Lord, our righteous savior. And, and so people are, many, many of the scholars that I was reading through in their commentaries, they were saying that this is saying like where Zedekiah is failing the people, there's going to be a better king 
who the Lord, our righteous Savior. And so kind of a, a play on Zedekiah's name with an expectation for a new righteous king. Because uh, Zedekiah, uh, the word Zedek is um, part of the root for righteousness. And so um, so that's why people are looking. And Aya is the name of God. And so this is where people are like, oh, this is a, a bit of wordplay happening here. Uh, that the people would have been like, okay, where Zedekiah fails, a new king will come and protect us, preserve us, and lead us into safety. Uh, so when that king is coming, the people would not necessarily know um, because there's, there's the rumblings of Babylon coming. And already at Zedekiah's time, a good number of the people had been taken away. Uh, and so the first exile from Jerusalem was in 597. Uh, and so in 586, the rest of ex of Jerusalem will be exiled. Um, and so like the people in 597 that were exiled would, would have been um, Jehoiakim was taken. I believe I get it, I, last week got all confused, but one of one of the kings was taken. Uh, people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they would all have been taken at that point. Ezekiel was taken uh, in the exile at that 597. Um, and so... Yeah, so there was already some who are gone and scattered uh, as Jeremiah is giving this oracle. So talking about the people scattered to the nations, they need a shepherd to bring them home. And someday there will be that shepherd. So let's uh, keep going. Chapter 23, verses 7 through 8. So then the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he banished them, then they will live in their own land. So here is the a major shift in the story that Israel, the people of Israel are going to say about themselves. Up until this point, the, the major uh, divine action on their behalf was the Exodus event where the Lord saved them from slavery in Egypt. Now there is a new event, a new defining uh, experience for the nation of the Lord saving them from captivity from the land of the north, which is Babylon and Assyria, this, the former Assyrian Empire, the current Babylonian Empire. And it's called the land of the north because not because Babylon or Assyria are necessarily north of Jerusalem, uh, but because they would have come from the north. So it might as well have been the north. They were taken to the north. So, um, yeah, but this is the the promise that the Lord is going to rescue and draw them back. And as we continue on uh, in Jeremiah, there's going to be more and more emphasis and uh, talking to the exiles who are in Babylon and giving them instruction to walk in faithfulness, while the people in Jerusalem uh, who remain uh, are going to continue to experience the Lord's judgment. And we'll get to that in chapter 24 a bit. So uh, let's keep going. Chapter 23, 9 through 12. Uh, verse 9. Concerning the prophets, this is Jeremiah speaking. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble. I am like a drunken man, like a strong man overcome by wine because of the Lord and his holy words. The land is full of adulterers. Because of the curse, the land lies parched and the pastures in the wilderness are withered. The prophets follow an evil course and their power and use their power unjustly. Both prophet and priest are godless. Even in my temple, I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. Therefore, their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness and there they will fall. Uh, I will bring disaster on them in the year they are punished, declares the Lord. So this is... Um, the warning to, so the first section that we looked at was the warning to the kings. Um, the next section here is warning to the false prophets. And Jeremiah, as he's uh, talking about this, is revealing that this is a message that he doesn't really want to share. Like his, he's shaking. He's overwhelmed with the weight of what he is saying. Um, he's grieving, knowing that these false prophets are going to um, bring him more pain also. Like he's, 
trying to correct the false prophets and the people he's trying to help them to not listen to the false prophets. Uh, but they also are going, it's going to be harder for Jeremiah uh, as he brings this message that they don't want to hear. But that's part of the job of God's prophet, telling people things they don't want to hear. And, uh, and so the land is full of adulterers. And this is a, you know, meta metaphorical adultery uh, in the first sense where the prophets and the priests both uh, are serving idols and pulling people away from faithfulness to the Lord. And, uh, and so that's the adultery that he's talking about. And because of this, all the curses that they are experiencing, the war, the, the siege from Bab the Babylonian army, droughts, sickness, all of these things were a part of the, uh, the curses that would come about on the people for their unfaithfulness that the Lord spelled out in the book of Deuteronomy. And I think it's chapter 28 off the top of my head. Um, and so their rebellion is bringing about the things that God warned them would happen. Um, but they're too stubborn to see that they're the ones bringing these things about. And so they continue uh, to lead people toward uh, towards the, the Baal worship or the Asherah pole or all the different things um, because they think, well, maybe we just, if we just get the right kind of incantation and we convince the, these, these deities to uh, heal our land, maybe it'll work. And it never works. Prophet, uh, the prophets are lying to the people and the idols are lying to the prophets and idols always lie. And they always take more than they, than you think they will. Um, but the Lord is saying, I will bring this uh, destruction on the false prophets and the priests. The land will be slippery. They will not, so they won't be able to have a footing um, and they're going to go out into darkness. Um, so the, Path metaphor is a key piece here as well. Um, it's, you know, Jeremiah's used it elsewhere. It's talked about in Proverbs, it describes life as a journey. Uh, the godly path, the path of life is what, what the Lord wants for his people. Um, but the, uh, the idolatrous people and the false prophets and the false priests are leading people on a path of death and destruction. And so, um, yeah, so one of the key metaphors is, is where, what path are you walking on? And, um, you know, Jesus will say like narrow is the path and few will enter. Um, and, and so part of that remnant message is that there are going to be, uh, the path will continue to, uh, be less desirable to people who want to follow their own self-interests. And so they would rather go for the broad path, the, the easy path. But the Lord calls his people to a kind of righteousness uh, that is the, is the narrow path. So the, there is warning coming to the, the false prophets. There is destruction coming to the false prophets and the false priests. But let's keep going. Chapter 23, verses 13 through 15 says, Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal. And led my people Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. I will make them eat bitter food and drink poisoned water. Because from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. And so over and over again in the book of Isaiah, we saw warnings against the false prophets uh, and, and the worship of Baal and the idols. Uh, and that led to the Northern kingdom being taken away. And so this message here is like, Hey guys, remember how bad the Sumerians, uh, the false prophets in, in Israel were in Samaria. They were bad, right? The prophets in Jerusalem are worse. It's worse here than it was in, uh, in Samaria in the Northern kingdom. And anytime the, the word of God talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, that is one, uh, that is a, 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 a red flag. Like this is serious stuff because Sodom and Gomorrah was, those cities were destroyed 
because of their their wickedness, uh, which included uh, the you know the sexual assault of God's messengers, uh, attempted a sexual assault. Uh, it included their mistreatment of the poor and the vulnerable. There were all kinds of things that were uh, that brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah and their destruction. Some in the northern kingdom, those people were just taken away. But the people of Jerusalem being like Sodom and Gomorrah is like a it should be a warning to say, oh, remember what happened to them? They were destroyed. And so the people of Jerusalem should not feel comfortable and safe uh, just because they are living in Jerusalem. Their, their wickedness is what is going to bring about the judgment that God is talking about. And what are these prophets doing is, you know, they are committing adultery and it's a spiritual adultery, maybe even a physical adultery. They're not, they're, you know, falling away from God's sexual ethic. Uh, they live a lie. So they are telling falsehoods and they are living out like the falsehoods are truths. Um, but they also strengthen the hands of evildoers. And so they are assisting the people who are bringing harm to others. They are assisting the vile, the corrupt, the, the leaders who are not caring for the people. These prophets, these false prophets are cozying up to power in a way that is bringing maybe them notoriety and prestige, but it is not helping God's people. It is not God's message that these prophets are bringing. And so Jeremiah, as a, a true prophet of God, is bringing this message. And it's like, again, like it's overwhelming to him how corrupt the, the other prophets are, uh, but he is compelled. He can't not say these words. Um, so, so yeah, so Jerusalem uh, will face this punishment, but the prophets themselves, they're not going to get off uh, away from this. And so it's talking about eating bitter food and poisoned water. Um, and so this is part of the, the punishment that they're going to experience is that their nourishment will not bring them any joy and it might even kill them is how the, the, the Lord is talking about it. They will pay for their, uh, their apostasy and their rebellion. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah. It's a good time. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, chapter uh, 23, 16 through 22 continues. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In the days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they stood, if they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. So these prophets, the message that they are saying is peace, peace. No harm is going to come to Jerusalem. It's no big deal. We can keep like flirting with these other idols and these false gods and don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Everything will be great. Uh, and they are saying, the Lord told me that this was going to happen uh, this way and nothing's going to happen to this city. And the Lord is just calling them out. I didn't tell them that. I didn't speak to these people. And they um, claim to have dreams and hear revelations from God. And they're all lies. It's all lies. It's not from the Lord. And one of the key uh, images here that the Lord is says is if they had stood in the counsel of the Lord, they would have heard my word. And the divine counsel is something that is very interesting to me. And it's something that, uh, you know, when we read through the book of Psalms, we, we have this 
a couple of verses. I uh, saw him like, I think Psalm 82 uh, talks about this council of the almighty. And, and then when we read the book of Job, uh, we read about God and all of the, like he's having like a heavenly board meeting or something. Uh, and like Satan comes, the accuser comes to the meeting. And this is what like this divine council is where God is like he's speaking and giving direction to angels or even fallen angels, like the, the accuser, like the Satan. And, and so there are, there's this mis mystery around this divine council. Um, but what Jeremiah's word is saying is saying here is like, if they had been in this council, they would have, they would know that they know that they know that they had heard from God because God's word would have so deeply shook them. So even with, uh, with Jeremiah, <clears throat> I mean, back up with Isaiah in Isaiah six, when he's called, like he comes into the, the throne room of the Lord. And he says, woe is me for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And like, that's the kind of the, like the divine council room that like the people, if they had experienced that, they would have uh, immediately repented. And then even Jeremiah, as he's talking about the word of the Lord coming to him is like, Jeremiah wasn't physically transported into this dimension of the divine council, but he's having a kind of overwhelming experience of the knowledge and reality of God and the word of God. That's like, I can't keep this in me. It's got to come out. And it's, it's not something that I want to say. And so the, this message to the false prophets here in Jeremiah is something that, you know, we should read with great attention in our current age. Um, and, you know, as a you know Pentecostal pastor, I believe in the gift of prophecy, but I do believe that there are many people who are claiming to be prophets who are just saying what we want to hear, who are just saying peace, peace, and putting things on in the name of God that are not what God wants. And so the danger there is that they are using the name of the Lord in vain. That's what it really means. Putting God's name on something that God wants nothing to do with. And so when we talk about these false prophets, like it's not just a then problem. And I know I've said this before. And when we were talking in Isaiah and even in earlier parts of Jeremiah, these false prophets are a thing that we should be mindful of and watch out for and be discerning of as we are in our current world um, and all of the things. And so if the prophet tells you things that you just like love to hear all the time, that's probably a good indicator that they are not God's true prophets. Um, and so if a prophet never confronts the sinfulness of people, uh, then that's not a good sign. Um, just FYI, reading biblical prophets, a lot of confront confronting happening. So anyway, uh, I'll keep going. Chapter 23, verses 23 through 24, uh, the Lord says, Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord? and not a God far away who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth declares the Lord. And this small section, uh, you know, is important for a couple of reasons because I'm going to use some biblical or theological terms here. There is an understanding of the transcendence of God, like God is big and he's, you know, far and he's over, over all of the earth. He's transcendent. But then there's also a sense of the imminence of God. God is near, he's close, he is with me. And what this passage is, is, is highlighting is that God is nearby, but he's also far away. He's what we call omnipresent, but also in this section, he can see the secret places. You, you can't hide from him. So he's omnipresent and he's omniscient. He knows, he knows what we would rather keep secret. And so part of the tension here is there's this, in Jerusalem, there are people here in the city, but then there's also these people in the exile. And so, uh, you know, they're wondering like, well, if we're here in Jerusalem, maybe God is here with us and only with us, but that is not the case because he's also with the exiles. He's everywhere. And so he's not, he's, he's imminent, near and transcendent far. And so he's, um, yeah, so you can't hide from God. And this is a, a theme throughout 
uh, the Bible as well. Like, where could I go to hide from you? Nowhere. Even uh, I've, I'm, I'm working on some Jonah uh, writing and Jonah is, you know, he's trying to hide from God in his rebellion and he hides down in the, the, the boat and like lower levels of the boats and the storm comes and he's like sleeping trying to hide from God. And then he's like, throw me in the ocean and, and uh, trying to get away from God. And, and then God sends him the fish and saves his life. And even as he's going down, down, down into the depth, it's like, Oh, I guess, I guess God, you're saving me. Uh, I guess I can't get away from you. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, God is everywhere, which is good news. It's not a, it's not something that we should be afraid of because the transcendence of God is overwhelming and the imminence of God can also feel overwhelming, but he's near because he loves his people. He wants to be in relationship with us. And so we should welcome his, his imminence and, uh, and his, and his transcendence. So, uh, let's keep going. Chapter 23 verses 25 through 32, a bit longer section, um, but we'll keep on keeping on. The Lord says, I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord. This is not my word, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead the, my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. And so the Lord is fed up with these false prophets. They're saying again, like I had a dream and the Lord's like, I didn't send them that dream. Then they also, uh, <laughs> the other thing that's happening here is, They'll hear one prophet say something and then they'll be like, I, oh yeah, I also had that word from the Lord came to me. And so they're like, they're plagiarizing each other, trying to sound important and prominent. But the Lord is saying, all of this is lies. All of these false prophets are just lying to the people. And, um, and so they are, what the, Lord, what the Lord says here is like, the true prophet will speak God's word and it will nourish the people. It will help them. So it's like, this is a good thing. Even if you don't want to hear it, it's a good thing like grain. There's nutrients here. But the false prophet, it will speak to the people and it will just be straw, worthless, not good for eating. Um, so, but then also his word is like fire and like a hammer. They are powerful. They are destructive. Uh, they are for they are purifying and forming things, the words of God. Whereas these false prophets, their words are are nothing. Um, and so they can keep on wagging their own tongues. I love that image. Like like my 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 dog Maggie, uh, she uh, when she's really hot, like she pants and her tongue stick like sticks out. And she's like, like that's basically what the prophets are doing, just like running around trying to get impressed, like be impressive, but it's just like a wagging tongue. It's nonsense. Uh, and they need to just ignore the prophets. So the best thing to do with a false prophet, when you're like, I don't think this is true. I don't think what this, this prophet is saying is true. The best thing to do is just ignore them. Just don't listen to them. And if you hear your friends or family who are getting wrapped up in false prophets, just say, that is not God's word. You should not listen to them. Turn away. And then point them to Jeremiah chapter 23 and 24. Um, and so, yeah, so the Lord is saying, stop. These false prophets need to stop. It will, um, yeah, it will not go well for them. All right. Uh, another one last section in chapter 23, verses 33 through 40. When these people a, or a prophet or a priest ask you, what is the message from the Lord? Say to them, what message? I will forsake you, declares the Lord. 
a prophet or a priest or anyone else claims, this is a message from the Lord. I will punish them and their household. This is what each of you keeps saying to your friends and other Israelites. What is the Lord's answer? Or what has the Lord spoken? But you must not mention a message from the Lord again, because each one's word becomes their own message. So you distort the words of the living God, the Lord Almighty, our God. This is what you keep saying to a prophet. What is the Lord's answer to you? Or what has the Lord spoken? Although you claim this is a message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You used the words, this is a message from the Lord, even though I told you that you must not claim this is a message from the Lord. Therefore, I will surely forget you and cast you out of my presence along with the city I gave to you and your ancestors. I will bring you everlasting disgrace, everlasting shame that will not be forgotten. So people are going to their prophets saying, what does the Lord have for me? They're treating the prophet more like a fortune teller than an actual representative of the Lord the living God. And so everything they say is just, they're just making it up. And so the, the Lord knows this and he's saying like, you got to stop. You got to stop doing that. Uh, you need to stop even saying, this is the word of the Lord to you because it's all lies. And, uh, and so, yeah, so God's got a lot to say about false prophets and he is, wants the people to understand that he takes this very seriously. Um, and so Jeremiah, as the true prophet, is telling all these things, uh, and you know they're going to turn on him pretty hard uh, in the coming chapters um, because he's going to keep uh, showing them their, that they're lying, and he's going to stay truthful and faithful to the Lord. But falsely claiming revelations from God will bring pain to the people doing the false claims, and so. It is just not worth it uh, to try to be impressive or try to say you're a prophet if you are not. And so the gift of prophecy, like I said, I, as Pentecostal pastor, the gift of prophecy, the spiritual gifts, they are alive in the church today. But we, everything we say should align with God's word that he has already said. And so we should not try to bring a new revelation uh, to the Lord which these false prophets were, were trying to do. We're bringing a new revelation, telling people that they can worship the Baals and it will be fine. And that is, that is not how God rolls. He is a jealous God and not in a way like, oh, my feelings were hurt and you're... No, he's like, I love you enough to fight for you, that kind of jealousy. And now the people have turned so far. And he's like, well, now the only option is the coming judgment. And so he says, I will remove you from the land. And the, the city that I promised you, it, it will be a disgrace for generations to come. So that's the warning to the, the priests, the prophets, the kings in chapter 23. Chapter 24 is a shorter chapter. Uh, and it says this, after Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, was king of Judah, and the officials, the skilled workers, and the artisans of Judah were carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Lord showed me two baskets of figs placed in front of the temple of the Lord. One basket had very good figs, like those that ripen early. The other basket had very bad figs, so bad they could not be eaten. Then the Lord asked me, what do you see, Jeremiah? Figs, I answered. The good ones are very good, but the bad ones are so bad they cannot be eaten. And so here we are, this, this oracle is, this is where I was talking about like chronology doesn't always fit. This oracle probably was actually written before the previous chapter, but it's placed in chapter 24. I don't know why. So, but the uh, the image that is given to the Lord is this basket of figs, really good ones and really bad ones. Uh, and uh, and so they, uh, we don't really know at this point what's going on here, but the Lord is, saying, is showing him this. And these two baskets of figs uh, are showing us uh, an important thing. So in verse four, uh, chapter 24, verses four through seven, then the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, like these good figs, I regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up 
and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God for they will return to me with all their heart. So these good figs are not the people in Jerusalem. It's the people who are in exile. And this is part of the the reversal that uh, that I was talking about. Like, this is not what people would have expected. People would have expected like, hey, we're still here in Jerusalem, God's favorite city. This is where we need to be. So we are going to be protected by God. And God says, no, uh, this whole city is going to be destroyed. I'm taking all the good people over here. I'm taking them out of this land and I will replant them later. And so this image of what the Lord says, I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. That's an echo back to Jeremiah's own calling. But the Lord said, you will plant, you will tear down, you will re uproot all of these things Jeremiah was going to do. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to do this with this whole community that's in exile. They're the good figs. Even though it doesn't feel good, even though they, they, they are removed from the land, they're the remnant that God is talking about. They're the ones that will be uh, used by God in the future. And they will return. Uh, he says, I will be their God for they will return to me with all their heart. And so the exile is this uh, transformity, transformative uh, season and, and these years of change for the people where they wreck the folks who were taken into exile, recognized the sinfulness that led the people into exile in the first place. And they, they came home with a greater uh, faithfulness to the Lord generally. Not everybody, not everybody, we'll get to that, but generally a greater faithfulness to the Lord and a greater uh, awareness of the seriousness of following him with all their hearts, um, not just for convenience sake. So God will protect them even though they're in exile. Meanwhile, uh, chapter 24, verses eight through 10, but like the bad figs, which are so bad they cannot be eaten, says the Lord, so will I deal with Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials and the survivors from Jerusalem, whether they remain in the land or live in Egypt, I will make them abhorrent and an offense to all the kingdoms of the earth, a reproach and a byword, a curse and an object of ridicule wherever I banish them. I will send the sword, famine and plague against them until they are destroyed from the land I gave to them and their ancestors. So just because you live in Jerusalem doesn't mean you've got it all figured out. And Zedekiah, who eventually will like run away, uh, you know, and try to get away, like, but he won't, he'll be captured, he'll be killed. Like this is, the, the Lord is saying, like, you can try to run to Egypt, you can try to get away from the judgment that's coming, but it, it, it won't work. And instead of being this, the shining city on a hill, that God wanted Jerusalem to be, they will be a byword. And a byword is a, it's a great, great Bible term where it's like, did you hear about? You know, it's just that like that the, the thing you say under your breath when you don't want other people to hear how bad the thing is. That's what's how the Lord is talking about what's going to happen to Jerusalem. And all the nations of the earth will see the destruction and be like, oof. Jerusalem. Can you believe that? That was a bad, that was, a, that was awful. What could they have done that would led their God to let this happen? And Jeremiah has been making the argument throughout. It's their own wickedness, their own rebellion and sinfulness. So the good figs, God is not done with them, but the bad figs, their time is short. So let's stop there. Uh, and if there's any questions or comments we can we could talk a little bit about those things so any thoughts all right i see some unmuting happening <laughs> carrie did you have something i'm just trying to wrap my head around so the exiles they were sent away to basically reroute their heads. I kind of was under the impression that they were the ones who had led the people astray. Uh, no, the prophets, the priests, there were bad kings. Yeah, they, they, yeah, but the, the exiles themselves, the Daniels, the Ezekiels, 
those were part of that good group that were taken to, to Babylon. And so there were faithful people that were rescued from the judgment in Jerusalem and taken to exile. Exile was the rescue for them. Oh, okay. Because when I was looking at it, it shows, you know, the, like with Daniel, you know, some of the higher echelon people, probably the higher ups, the kings, mm -hmm. it seemed like those are, so were the kings the ones, the kings and their people, the ones that were sent into exile? Uh, people of influence were sent into exile. So not just, not, there's only one king, like there's only okay. one king at a time. And so, right. um, yeah, so the the court, uh, the royal court, the royal family, um, people of influence, they they were all taken, but as well as, uh, you know, artists and, uh, you know, uh, city officials, uh, like military officials, those were all people that were taken um, into exile because they were influential, powerful. The goal, you know, with these kinds of exile moves is to kind of, is to try to reculture them into empire. Um, mm -hmm. And so the story of Daniel is, you know, here's one of these exiles who will not be recultured into the empire, but will stay faithful to the Lord. So. Okay. That's kind of what it meant. Kings and his court, basically. Yeah. Um, more yeah. But so that first round of exiles were mostly the influencers. Okay. Then, then there's another round in 586 of more exiles that would be taken. And that's more, more common people were taken then. And those are some of the people that the Lord is saying here, those are going to be good figs. Those common people that are taken, they're also good figs. Because God is going to do, God is going to do the restoring and transformative work in exile. And some of them in exile still even remain bad, bad figs, the rotten figs. Am I correct? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, every community has some bad apples, right? We we know that expression. Um, so not everybody is, not everybody just because they're in exile is a righteous person. But God's promise is this exile community will be the the means through which He will restore uh, the nation of Israel. So God was basically kind of rerouting these guys, these people's heads. So when they went back to Israel, they would be able to lead in the godly way. Uh, right? Yeah. I mean, it was 70 years. So it was like generations that were in exile. Hmm. And so like Daniel didn't go home. Right. Like he, he probably died okay. in Babylon or Persia at that point. Um, and so, but like some people who are very young did go home. And so they may have been part of that leadership community, but yeah. So like, a, like the wilderness wandering of the people in Exodus and uh, in the Pentateuch, right? They were 40 years, a whole generation died in the wilderness so that a new generation could move into the land. The exile is essentially two generations cycling through to like really reset the people. <laughs> so, yeah. Amazing. And and Jeremiah is still speaking to these people in exile? Right now, he's addressing no, the people before. in Jerusalem. Right. He will start to shift towards addressing the exiles. Right. When I read ahead, I thought I, I, I kind of thought, oh, maybe he's speaking to them, the exiles. Yeah, he will. He, it, when, yeah, you're ahead. So he will. Um, the most famous of all of this is chapter 29. The, the letter to the exiles, but he's starting to turn his attention to what God wants to do to those people who are in Babylon and the people who are also then coming to Babylon. Um, yeah. Yeah. But good, good catch on that, Carrie. So uh, well, it's, not, it's hard to wrap your mind around. Okay. Who's he talking to? Which grouping of people and who actually was part of the exile versus the people who were in Jerusalem thinking they were all happy and okay. Yeah. I'll do my best to point that out when we make that shift. So, but right now we're still talking to the Jerusalem people. So. No, you're doing good. So when I'm reading it on my own, I'm like, who is he actually speaking to? Who is right. the audience? Yeah. So, yeah. And that's just, um, sometimes it gets confusing. And so you're right. You're, it's not, you're not wrong for being like, I don't know who he's talking to right now. So, um, so hopefully when we finish Jeremiah in the year of our Lord, 2028, because this is a big book, uh, we will um, have that sorted. 
it won't take till 2028. I was joking. Um, so we will be so aged. We'll have wisdom. Well, I hope so. Age doesn't always lead to wisdom. There's some other things that have to happen there as well. So, um, yeah. Any other thoughts or, or questions? No. I am just astounded, I guess, with the false prophet still. Mm -hmm. You know, the, he is telling people, he, they were making it so people didn't know what to believe, I think. Yes. Jeremiah is speaking the truth. They're speaking their quote own truth. And so the people in the middle are thinking, oh, who do I follow? Uh, yeah, but it was easier for them to follow the false prophets because the false prophets told them what they wanted to hear. Yeah. So that's... That is still, I think, one of the best metrics even today. Like, if you have a prophet that you just always agree with, um, and they tell like there, there's a massive crowd following them. Watch out! <laughs> well, watch out! <laughs> so, um, question for you on those false prophets: Wouldn't you speak to them and say, "Okay, prove to me where is it at in the Bible?" Yeah, you can, or just ignore them and don't listen to them. Sure, that's easier the, route. The, 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 the easiest route is to just put the false prophet into obscurity and and stick to the word of God and to the community of faith and to say, like, all right, this is what like we're leaning into God's word, not into our feelings. And and so yeah. I've read the Bible enough to know that there's a lot of stuff in there that's gonna confront confront our times and our preferences over and over again. So there's plenty. Yeah. There's plenty. So we don't. Yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm trying very hard to not get up on a soapbox on the uh, the false prophets. So just FYI. <laughs> so <laughs> this is called restraint. Uh, <laughs> and some of you are like really is it? <laughs> so all right. Well, let's uh, wrap here, and uh, we'll come back. We'll do 25 and 26 is what I'll target for next week. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's already going to be the last week of January next week. It's crazy how time just keeps on moving. Uh, so I hope to see you Sunday. If not Sunday, I'll see you back on here on Wednesday and uh, y'all have a good week.